probably can't see it anyway. Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing dividing the sunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thought and intention of the heart. And all scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And what do we say? The spiritual spin stopped right here because we care for you. So we're going to take about 15 seconds uh, to prepare yourself for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. That means confessing any known sins that you've committed since the last time you had a time of confession. 1 John 1 9, you name it, God forgives it. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, you prepare yourself, and Steve will close us out in prayer time. Father, we come to you, ask your blessings upon this study. And having looked ahead to see the topic, we understand that uh, this is the most important thing in human history, both for mankind and for nations, the acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ, his word. Mm -hmm. So this is the most vital study we could ever have probably. And so we ask your blessings on what is taught here, that it will be understood, it will be metabolized and be applied into our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Steve. Okay, folks. Uh, so our study today, it, the title of it is What is Christianity? And I would I would just hazard a guess that 90% of those who claim to be Christ, uh, claim to be Christians in this country today are going to give you an answer that does not jive with the word of God. So I felt it important, and each time we have met, I've tried to do a different, uh, something different than what we do uh, in our in our series of studies. And I chose this this subject uh, probably uh, three or four weeks ago. So the idea is, what is Christianity? Now you may be here today and be a born again Christian. You know that you're saved. You know you're going to heaven. But the question is, what happens after that? And this passage in 2 Peter is an amazing passage of Scripture. And once we get done, I would rather believe that you're probably going to have to take your notes home and refresh your minds about this, because there are several things here that are going to tell you exactly what a Christian should look like. Now, with that in mind, then, I'll go ahead and turn to my notes, and you can follow your notes if you desire. But don't get so distracted by your notes you don't hear what I say, okay? So here's the issue. Christianity is not a religion. That's the first thing you need to realize. I was uh, I was looking for uh, the scripture in other versions of the Bible, just browsing through those passages, and I I was in um, I believe it was in the Good News for Modern Man, and if you read that 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 section of scripture in Good News, it it's pretty pretty easy to understand. The question is, is it accurate? And uh, immediately as we got into there, it was talking about Christianity as a religion. He used the word religion in the passage of scripture. So that's just simply going to confirm to millions of people that believe that Christianity is a religion. Now, that's just another one. Buddhism, Shintoism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism. Yeah, Christianity is just one of all those. No, it isn't. Christianity is unique because it is a spiritual way of life. So in my notes, I said Christianity is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of just going to church, singing in the choir, going to Sunday school class, carrying a Bible, whatever. No, Christianity is a personal relationship with Christ. And in, in, uh, in God's plan found in the Bible, you're born separated from God. And the question is, what's it going to take to be joined to him again? Just like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden when they were created. What's it going to take? Well, here you are as a, as a human being. You have an old sin nature in every cell of your body. You are um, you're operating out of the flesh, 
according to functioning in the in the sphere of the flesh, uh, doing human good, committing personal sins, and you think, eh, I'm doing the best I can, and I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven, but uh, there's something wrong in my life. So the idea is this, that while a single act of faith will place you in Christ, and believing that, here it is, believing that he died, he was buried, he was resurrected three days later, that's the gospel. You believe that, you believe that, you're saved for an eternity. And again, many Christians, they've, they've done that, but they're, how about this? Their spiritual life stinks. You see them and you see, wait a minute, you're a born again Christian. Uh, you were, you're asking me to become a Christian. But if I'm going to be a Christian and look like that, I don't need your Jesus. So the question is, what is the Christian way of life really all about? John 3.16 is a passage of scripture we can use to confirm the fact that if you've trusted Christ, you are eternally saved. Look at that passage. For God so loved the world. He loved the whole world. That's believer and unbeliever. He loved the whole world, and that includes you. And he, God the Father, gave his only begotten son, that's uniquely born son, that whosoever, let me see, who would whosoever be? Ah, uh, yeah, that might be me. It is you. So whosoever believeth in what? Whosoever believeth in him. Doesn't say who, whosoever believeth is baptized, speaks in tongues, goes to church, gives it, pays the tithe or whatever. No, no, no. He says, believes in Christ. What happens? You will not perish. That means you won't go to hell. You won't go to the lake of fire. You're not eternally condemned. However, but conjunction of contrast, you have, because you believe you have everlasting life. Question, how long is everlasting? You can't lose it. Everlasting is forever. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have eternal salvation. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. You couldn't miss it if you wanted to. But the truth of the matter is, what have you been doing since you have been saved? Okay? So when any person is willing to trust John 3, 16 and other verses of Scripture that confirm the fact that belief in Christ alone is required for salvation, God the Father provides eternal salvation for that person. However, and this is the thing that I want Christians to know, I try to help people wherever they are when you meet them and you say, yeah, I'm a born-again Christian, but salvation, spiritual salvation, is not the end of the line for the Christian way of life. Salvation is just the beginning. Now, the truth of the matter is, I was saved. I was saved in 1962 on the island of on the island of Trinidad. I was. I knew I was saved. Well, no, I, I really didn't. For six months, I battled the idea of eternal security. Six months into that Christian way of life, I was, it was confirmed that I was eternally saved. The only problem then was I didn't know how to live the Christian way of life. I did stop a few things that I was doing, but that wasn't enough. I thought I was be, being the, just doing the best I can. So you need to realize that at the moment of salvation, this is for you today, at the moment of salvation, you must become aware of the fact that you, and if I walked right around this crowd right here and started over here with Kim and went right around the table and did the, just called you by name, this is talking to you. This is for you. This is for you, especially from the scripture. Here's the issue. At the moment of salvation, you must become aware of the fact that you are an agent for God the Father. God the Father has a plan. Remember the angelic conflict? I'm telling you, if you don't understand the angelic conflict, nothing in life makes any sense to you. Why in the world am I here? Why do I have all this pressure? Why are things going wrong? Oh, here's, a, here's something that went right. Oh, yeah, I'm glad for that. But you see, you became an agent for God the Father in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, and it happened the moment you were saved. So if you don't understand that, you're walking along and wandering around in life, trying to make the best you can, trying to find peace, trying to find happiness, but it just seems to be escaping you the way it was with me also. So here's the issue. Although, although the apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, although he is writing to a group of Christians in his time, during his time, be like me writing a letter to you and you getting it three or four days later. Well, Peter is writing this letter to a group of Christians somewhere off other than where he is locally. And if you're a born again Christian, what I want you to know is this is scripture. The word of God is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of God. 
And in this period of time that we call the age of grace, where, where God has founded the body of Christ, this actually is written for you also. So as we un unfold the scripture about Peter talking to these Christians there, it also has a dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic necessity for you and me also. Now, let's look at verse, verses one and two. And what I want you to understand is, generally speaking, in these epistles, as, it, as an apostle is writing the epistles, the first verse or first couple of verses is no more than a salutation. It's friendly greeting. But the terms that they use are doctrinally sound and extremely important to you. So as you live your Christian way of life, one of the things you need to do is to understand what words mean in the Bible. What do they mean? So as we, as we follow through verses one and two, Simon Peter was this man's name. He was Simon. That word Peter means rock. He was a rock, okay? Simon Peter, that's, that's who, he is, who he is humanly. That's who he is personally. But spiritually, he is a bond servant. Now the scripture uses the word bond servant. There are other, other versions of the Bible that would use the word slave. Now that word slave is, uh, is offensive to many people, but when you're talking about the spiritual life, you need to realize, yes, you are a bond servant, Peter was, but you also as a born again Christian are a bond servant for Je to Jesus Christ. And what that means, you are a slave to him. Now that you have chosen the Christian way of life, and there's no better way to choose because anything else other than that is disastrous, eternally disastrous. So when you choose that, you need to realize that Jesus Christ is your master. He is my master. He is your master. And what do you do with what do you do with a master? You do what the master says. So Jesus actually told us in the gospels, and we don't live in the gospels, but he made a comment that if you love me, if you love me, I say, Steve, see, that's the hot seat. Andy, what the hot seat? Okay. Yeah. So so the, the idea is say, uh, Steve, I say, do you love the Lord? And you say, oh, yes, I love the Lord. I said, well, then why aren't you living like that? He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'll tell you, we were studying, uh, I think it was uh, in, a, in a book recently, an epistle recently, whether it was Jude or another one. In two chapters, there were over 40 commands. Over 40 commands. Now, it, this is why if you don't know the commands, if you don't know the word of God, eh, here it is. You're just going to flop through life, okay? So the idea here is Peter is a bond servant. He's a slave to Jesus Christ. He's the master. And he said a bond servant and an apostle. The, the bond servant and the apostle are his spiritual titles. That's what, he, that's what he's all about. Then it says he's going to write this to those who have received a faith. And that faith is, remember, three, the word faith means three things. Inhale faith, I believe. Exhale faith, I apply. The body of the, the body of doctrine to be believed, that's the faith with, a, with, the, uh, with the word the in it, specific, the faith. That's, that's the Christian way of life. So he says, I'm writing to those who have, who have joined in with the Christian way of life and have the same kind of faith as ours. So Peter is a, he is a born-again believer. He's writing to born-again believers. And he's, he is all this, he says, by the righteousness of our God the Father. See, that word God there, he says God and Savior, God the Father, God the Son. The Father is the author of the plan. The Son is the executor of the plan. So he is a, he's a, a bond servant. He is a, an apostle by the righteousness of God the Father. So what happened is God the Father is, is absolutely righteous. And there is a spiritual pipeline from God the Father down to you. And the, the, the pipeline is a grace pipeline, which means whatever the righteousness of God tells just to send you, justice to send you, it's going to come down that grace pipeline, which means it, it, is, it is received by faith and not by some form of works. So God, he says, I have this apostleship, I have this um, this idea of being a servant of Jesus Christ, and it all came to me and came to you and me by the righteousness of God the Father. God the Father looks down and says, mm -hmm. I see Jim down there. Mm, I don't like the way he's choosing. God doesn't send anything. God looks down with his righteousness and says, oh, yes, I see that. I see the good choice down there. Justice, bless that man and send you whatever God wants to send you at that point in time. So it's the righteousness of God that makes all this available. Now, 
Look at verse two. He says, grace and peace. Grace is God's provision for you. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. And what we're going to see here in a few minutes is all that he has provided us. And I gave someone a set of notes this morning to indicating that the moment of you were saved, God the Father provided 51 things for you at the moment of salvation. So many people go through life saying, oh, God, I need this down here. But what, what's going on down here? Will you please help me, Lord? Help me. Listen, many of the prayers that are Help me, God. Help me, God. He looks down and says, I can't do it. He said, what do you mean you can't do it? I need help. He said, I gave it to you the moment you were born. Again, why don't you go to the spiritual bank and make a withdrawal? So that's the idea. God has provided most every, well, everything. He has provided everything we need. We'll see this here in just a moment. So grace, that word means God's provision. It means you don't earn it and you don't deserve it. Now, what happens is you have to manifest faith in what he's, what he's provided. You manifest faith. That's not work. God does, does not believe and teach us that faith is a work. Work would be uh, sweeping the floor, you know, going to church, uh, reading your Bible. No, that's not it. Everything that God provides is by faith, okay? So he says here in, in verse 2, grace, which is God the Father's provision, that carries you through. Look at if you look at your notes, it says, God the Father's provision that will carry you through most things. Is that what it says? What does it say? He said it will carry you through every circumstance of life. See, this is the spiritual way of life. He says grace and peace. What is peace? Well, peace is actually calmness of mind. Now think about this. See, this is, this is what Christianity is. God has made provision for you. So that during any problem in life, any circumstance of life, you are able to be mentally stable, mentally at peace with your circumstances, knowing that God is in control. He's allowed this situation to happen to bless your life, either to call you back to his plan or to bless you because you're carrying out his plan. So peace is calmness of mind during times of, of, um, of problems in your life. Now, notice what he said. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Well, what that means is they already have some grace. They already have, they are, they recognize grace. They have some mental stability, but it's not quite enough. And this is why when you become a born again Christian, you're going to have to grow through the various stages of the Christian way of life. You go from babyhood, the moment you're saved, you, you're in babyhood. Then as you, as you build that foundation of the word of God, then you're going to begin to build on that foundation and you enter into spiritual adolescence. It's like a teenager. Then when you reach uh, uh, adulthood, then you level off like this. So you're going from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual maturity. And we know that spiritual maturity is divided into three different categories. There's spiritual self-esteem where you have enough information that you know who you are in Christ. The past means nothing to you now because that's all been forgiven. You know who you are in Christ and you're not going to beat yourself to death for the rest of your life simply because of something you did back there. It's already been taken care of. So you move from spiritual self-esteem, knowing who you are in Christ, to spiritual autonomy, which means now you can stand on your own two feet. You're not seeking somebody every, every 15 minutes to bail you out. You're able to stand on your own two feet. And you pass the you pass the, the momentum test and you go into spiritual uh, maximum spiritual maturity where you have evidence testing where at that point in time we'll we'll not go there again. We've done that in the past, but there's testing all along your mature life. You can you can go to the bank on that. Now he says grace and peace be multiplied. So he says, You got some here, but you need, I'm praying that you will have more and more and more of grace and peace as you grow. He says, grace and peace, watch this now, grace and peace to you, how? He said, in the knowledge of God the Father. Grace and peace come to you by knowing who he is. You can't know who he is by not studying the word of God. And that's why God provides pastor teachers to unfold the meaning of the word. So your grace and peace, if you find yourself in life and you find yourself fumbling around and just not at ease, you're worried, you're concerned, uh, you're anxious. Uh, that's not what God wants. He said, but I'll tell you what, if you know who I am, 
and know what I've done for you, no matter what the circumstance is. He said, you'll have uh, the grace, grace provisions there. He said, you'll have mental stability no matter what the circumstance of life. Now, when you get to that point, Steve, guess what? People look at you as a Christian. They think you're wacko. They think you're crazy. You should be worried. You should be falling apart. No, this is what the Christian way of life is. This is what the spiritual life is. See, that, give, that gives you an opportunity to be an example to those people who are looking for Jesus and who truly want him, okay? Now, he goes on then in verse 2 and says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God the Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the execute of the God the Father is the author of the plan. So when you open up the Bible, you're seeing what God has authored. That's the inspired and inerrant and infallible word. But what made it work is the fact that Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, according to the, the Father's plan, came down here and was born of a, of a virgin in this mess down here. And for 33 years, he lived his Christian life. And on the day that he was to go to the cross, he went to the cross. And hanging on that cross, God the Father poured out your sins, my sins, and the sins of the world from the first man that ever lived to the last person who ever lived, poured all those sins out on Jesus. And for three hours, Jesus hung on that cross, separated from God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, he had forsaken him because God the Father can't look on sin, and his son had just become sin. He didn't sin. He became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So while Jesus was the righteous God dying for your sins, and here you are, the best you could do is self-righteousness will get you nothing but discipline from God. And the moment you believe, God poured out his righteousness into your life, and God begins to smile at you because you are on your way in the Christian way of life and in this spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So now in verse 3, now watch this. In verse 3, he says, for his, for his divine power, who is his? Well, that, letters, that word's capitalized, so you know that's divinity. But you got to be careful because sometimes it's not capitalized and it's still divinity, okay? So this is a reference to God the Father who's the author of the plan. So he's looking at you and he says, for his divine power. You know what divine power is? It's that big old word. What is it? Omnipotence. Omnipotence. That means all-powerful. So by his all-powerfulness, he granted. Now what you need to know about that word granted is you sitting there waiting. Oh, God, I, I, you see this thing I need down here? Oh, please, please meet my need, Father. And he said, well, I'm not going to do it until you do something. No, 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 no. You don't have to do anything. What God the Father gives you is free. There's no strings attached. It's like you saying, uh, here, I want to give you $100. And he said, what do I got to do for it? I said, no, take it. It's yours. Well, read, well, what? I must have to. Do. What don't you understand? Will you please take it? And when you take it, it's free. So what we see here, what God has provided for you, and we're going to see what he provided. He says, but what he has provided is free to you. All you have to do is take it. And so picture, picture the bank that you, that you use. And again, I use this analogy. Uh, you, you make a deposit into the bank, and then later you can go back and get something out of there, whatever you have in there. But see, in this case, God the Father has this spiritual bank out there, and he puts all, this, all these goodies in there for you. The blessings, the things that are going to carry you for every circumstance of life, they are already in your spiritual bank. So guess what? You don't know where the bank is, but it's the Word of God. So when you come to the Word of God, you see, Ooh, I, oh, look here, I didn't know he put that in there. When did, listen, ask, when did God put this, this, these goodies in your bank account? When did he put them in there? Help me. In eternity past. In eternity past, see, he saw you. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows reality and probability. So God looks down and says, Ooh, wait, there it is. Steve Haynes was saved in whatever year. And uh, and God sees that back in eternity past. And said, oh, I see him saved out there here. Whoop. He put all this information in his spiritual bank. So Steve gets saved and walks around all through life just... Oh, just so, so pitiful. You look and say, oh, I wish. Uh, if he just understood, Steve, go to the bank. Go to the spiritual bank. It's there. So what you're doing, come to the word of God to find out what's in there. And guess what? You withdraw it and use it for that circumstance of life. So he says, for his divine power has granted. Look at the next word. What is it? A few things. 
What is the word? He has got, he has granted everything, everything we need pertaining to life. That's physical life. So in eternity past, the moment you were saved, you can start to withdraw the things that he put in your bank that's in eternity past, and that's everything you will need for any circumstance of life. Then he goes on to say, not just that, but boy, this next word is gonna it's gonna wrap a whole lot of people in the head. Because here's what the Christian way of life is. He said he provides everything pertaining to life, that's physical life, and what? And what's the next word? Godliness. Godliness. And you know what that means? Everything that you need to do the right thing in the right way. See, godliness is doing the right thing in the right way. And I've made a comment in recent days, and someone said to me, you know, I've, th I've thought about that. One of the problems today is that evangelists, and I'm not, I'm not being critical, I'm being objective, as objective as I can. But if an evangelist is out here telling you about, the, uh, telling you about Jesus having died for your sins, and buried and resurrected and want you to believe so you won't go to hell in the lake of fire? And you say, oh, yes, I need that. Why doesn't he tell you also that once you become a born again Christian, that's not the end of your Christian life. You have to become exactly like Christ in his humanity. Not supernatural, not his deity, but exactly like Christ in his humanity. And I can show you five verses that mandate it mandate that you and I become exactly like Christ and his humanity. So this just going to church, singing in the choir, doing whatever, that's fine, that's fine. But that's not what the Christian way of life is. And you need to realize that on, the, on the, the day you die, you're going straight into heaven. But when Jesus come back in the air at the time of the rapture, what's the next event after the rapture of the church? What's the first event after the rapture? What's it called? The BS, the Bema Seat. It's the Bema Seat Judgment. And who's going to be there? Every born-again Christian. And is it? Is he going to call? Uh, he looked down and he said, oh, you see, on December the 12th, 2021, I see all those people, about 25 people, down there at American Pie Pizza. Let's just get the whole group up here. Is he going to call the group? Uh, group? You know what it's going to be? It's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, you and Jesus. So Jesus is standing here, and he calls you up, and he looks at your life. From the time you were saved, not, not before that, from the time you were saved until the time you die or the rapture occurs, and everything that you've done or not done at that time will be evaluated one person at a time. Now, what happens at that point in time, do you realize that if you live your Christian way of life and don't know what it means to live the Christian way of life, what a disaster that will be at the Bema Seat? And here's what he says. He said he doesn't want you to be ashamed so I didn't know you could be ashamed. You will at this point in time. You're in heaven. But what you're going to recognize is what you could have been but weren't. And you see the loss that is yours at the Bema Seat. Now, again, uh, Steve Haynes says, talks about my passion. Well, I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not beating on you. I'm just trying to tell you this the way it is. And the, my heart aches. My heart aches when I see the millions of people out here who don't understand what this is. And when you look, by the way, when you can you imagine... Brian told me if this is right, we, we, we believe that this, this tornado went through here. This is the first time, this is the first time in I don't know how many years you see things going on in New York. You see them going on in California. You see them going on someplace else uh, in states all around. the. Listen, Arkansas has been stone free up until now. And all of a sudden, bingo, down comes this tornado. And it, was it 200 miles or something? We, it was on the it was on the it was on the ground. It's an historical thing. Do you understand what's going there? God is trying to get people's attention. That's what pressure is. That's what these things are all about. And this is why eventually, and I'm my my passion is for you because listen, it it, it is not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better because we are the problem. And a man, a man that I was dealing with the other day the American Pastors Network made this statement. He said, people today are trying to find the solution on a horizontal plane. It's on the vertical plane. The answer is this direction, not this direction. It's not a new president. It's not a new congressman. It's not more money. It's not a new job. It's not a new marriage. It's not something you don't find the solutions on this plane. It's this way. And only the Christian who understands that this is what the Christian way of life, religion doesn't do this. Religion doesn't, doesn't give this to you. 
So it so it's he's provided everything referring to um, physical life and godliness, and godliness is doing the 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 right thing in the right way. Now watch in your notes. The next thing is that the next six words are going to tell you how to receive this godliness and everything pertaining to life. And here's how you do it. He says what? He said through the true knowledge. And by the way, in the Greek, in the Greek text, that word true knowledge, there's two words there. It's only one word. One word in the Greek. And you know it is epinosis, not gnosis. Gnosis is simply knowledge. Epinosis is full knowledge. Okay? So what that what he's saying here, when you have true knowledge, when you have a full knowledge of who this God is out there, you'll have, you'll be able to have this uh, everything pertaining to physical life, and you'll actually be able to become a godly person. So he said, uh, you have to have that true knowledge of him, that's God the Father, and what did God the Father do? Listen, who called us. Now listen, what happened if you are here in this, in this room today, and you are a born-again Christian, God called you. you say, Ooh, I can't believe that. Me? Yeah, he called you. What happened is his omniscience again saw you in time, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened is at a what when you're called, when you are called by God, it is because he knows you want to know more about him. See, that's God consciousness. You're born without a consciousness of God. But there, you look around and see all oh, this there, there's got to be a God out there somewhere. He said, Really? Yeah, I you're you're right. I'm up here. You want to know more about me? Well, I want to know more about that God. You know what happens? That's when God gets the gospel to you or you to the gospel. And he calls you through the gospel. So I tell you, listen, do you want to be born again? You want you want to spend eternity with God the Father, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, all of the folks that are Christian? Do you want to spend eternity with them? Oh, I sure do. He said, believe this. Jesus died, he was buried, and resurrected on your behalf. The scripture says that. So when you do that, there it is. You have, you have all that for, for eternity, but it comes through a true knowledge of this person called God. He is the one who authored all this plan. You're learning about him. Now he goes on to say here, who called us by his own glory. Now listen, what is the glory of God? We've, we've studied this. Now watch this. I want to help you. I want you to respond for me, okay? I want you to respond. His glory is are his attributes, his 10 attributes. We call it cell junior uive. What's the first one? What's the S? What's the E L? What's the L? What's the J? What's the R? What's the O? Okay, you there are three of them. There are three of them. So you say one. Um, okay, that, what's the other one? What's the other one? See, it's omniscient, omnipresence. Uh, yeah, that's what you've got him. Okay, now what's the I? And what is immutability? It means he's unchangeable. And what's, ver what's the last word? Veracity, what's that mean? He's truthful. So that's his glory. That's who he is. Now with that in mind then, by his own glory and his excellence, and his excellence there is his moral goodness. Can God do anything wrong? No, impossible. See, he is morally excellent. He's morally righteous. Now watch this. He said, through these, now we're moving on. This is your Christian life. He said, through these, what is these? Through his glory and through his excellence, he, God the Father, has granted again, no strings attached. He has granted to you and me, born again Christians, he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises. What is a precious a precious promise? It, a precious promise is a valuable promise. It means something that when you apply it to life will reap you benefit. It's beneficial to you. So the, the promises. Now listen, if you go out to the if you go out to the bookstore and you buy it, you, you're looking for a book that says, "Oh my goodness, I need to know the promises of God." So uh, I don't know what they are. So you go out and buy a book that's taken them from the Bible and written a book on these. The problem is when you buy it and says a hundred promises from God, they're not promises at all. Some may be, but generally they are a principle. A promise is a guarantee. It is a guarantee. God has made guarantees to you and I that if we will see, he told this to Israel. He said, if you will do this, I will do this. Okay. So God makes a promise and he promises you things. For example, let's say, let's say you have a situation where you're afraid. 
What do you need? You need a, you need a promise that's going to stabilize your mentality. And say, oh, here it is. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. So what you do, you take the promise and you apply it to that, to that circumstance. You believe it, you trust it, and God brings the, brings the solution, okay? So in verse, uh, in verse four then, he said, through these glory and, glory and excellence, he, God the Father, has granted to us precious and magnificent problems. And so the precious, they're valuable. Magnificent means large and in number. Woo, got a whole bunch of them out here, okay? Then he goes on to say, he gives them, watch this, why does he have those promises for you? This is the Christian way of life, so that by them, these promises, by them, what's he going to do? That by these precious and magnificent promises, you as a born-again Christian, not unbelievers, but you as a born-again Christian, that watch this, that you may become a partaker, a partner of what divine nature do you see what that says if i were to get up, if i were to stand up right now and walk around there and and just stand here look just just come to you and say when you apply these promises you're going to be able to experience divine nature in you that's the nature that's the that's the the very nature of jesus christ so when i see when i see you because you're applying these to your life, you may be called Tim Williams. You may be called David May. But what I see is this. Who am I seeing? Who am I seeing? Am I seeing Kim? Yeah, I'm seeing Kim all right. But what am I, what am I seeing about her? Who is she resembling? Jesus Christ. That's it. So, th so notice this. You have to have these promises. You have to have the word of God. You must be applying them to your life. And when you do so, you produce a divine nature. That's the nature of Jesus Christ. So by them, he said, you may become, you may become, now watch that, you may become. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. What it's telling you is now that you have it, you have to do something. You've got to apply it. So that you may become partakers of the divine nature. That's the likeness of, the, of Christ in his humanity. And watch what he says here. He says, having escaped. So when you have, when you have the divine nature, what you have done is you have escaped something. You have escaped the corruption that is in the world. I've told you in recent days, uh, the term that I'm using, today when we're walking around in life, listen, you're swimming, you're swimming in a septic tank. It's the septic tank of life, no matter where you look, how bad things are. But you don't have to be in that. You don't have, well, you're going to be in the septic. You can't get out of the septic tank until you die or the rapture. But what you can do, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to take on the, the, the scent, uh, the, the stench of life that's found in that septic tank. You don't have to be that. So he says here, because you're born again, you have all these things, having escaped the corruption, the sinful lifestyle. See, and by the way, I have another friend of mine. Uh, several years ago, I was, I was teaching at um, a Southeastern Youth Camp in um, in Birmingham, Alabama. Had several, had I don't know how many children in this thing, teenagers, it was just a whole room full. But I had several pastors there. And uh, I, I, when I went in, I, I, gee, I really went in with fear and trembling because I knew what I was going to teach. But when I thought, when I get to the point I'm going to teach this, no matter what kind of reaction I'm going to get from the pastors that are in here, and the, the point that I made, I said, listen, sin is a what? You've heard me say it. Sin is a what? It's a choice. And if you can choose to sin, you can do what? You can choose not to sin. So sin is a choice. So when you hear a pastor, when you hear a believer, somebody else telling you, oh, yes, we sin every day. Wait a minute. Just excuse me. Don't say that. Why shouldn't I say it? This is what all people do. No, all people don't sin every day. Sin is a choice. So if you make the choice not to sin, you're not sinning. You got that? And this is what the Christian way of life is. As you become more like Christ, there will be less of that kind of a lifestyle in your life. But he's going to tell you here where it all comes from. He said, you have escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of, because of, lust. Now watch. We, we know that we have an old sin nature. I give you that, di that diamond shape. 
that's the old sin nature. It's got it's got a, a place for uh, uh, sinful action, human good action. We've got uh, the trends of the trends of the uh, asceticism and uh, lascivious trends of the old sin nature. But on this other side, we have the lust patterns. Lust comes from the old sin nature. It's a sinful thing. So there are various types of lust that are in the world out here. We just name some of them. How about how about power lust? That's what you see going on in Washington D.C. right now. That's what you see going on in your federal governments, in this, uh, the governments in your state. That's what's happening going on in the counties. It's power lust. It's an old sin nature that causes that. And we're swimming in that kind of stuff. But that's why I say you better have something real in your life to be able to handle all that pressure that's coming down the pike in the near future. Fortunately, we in, in Arkansas, the gas prices have gone up. There are several other things that are happening. The mask and the, the mandates for the, the vaccines and stuff like that. But we haven't seen the likeness of anything what it's going to be like uh, here in Arkansas. Not yet. But I'm telling you, this is preparation for it, okay? So here, there's power lust, pleasure lust, and listen, I have no, I have no problem with the uh, with the, the Razorbacks and the, the Buckeyes and whatever uh, the the uh, the Dallas Cowboys or the Pittsburgh Pirates or what. I have no problem with that. But question: Where is where are all those things in your life? Is is it more are those more important than the Word of God? Or uh, you'll have to answer that question for yourself. Well, I tell you, I was a sports I was a sports maniac when I was a kid growing up. I've got trophies in basketball, baseball, uh, tennis, table tennis. I've got trophies in all that. That was my life. That's not where it's at. And this is why this, is why, uh, this man that I tell you about the other day said the answer is not on the horizontal. Man, if I just win another trophy, if I just sign another contract, if I can just do whatever. No, that's pleasure. But how about this? Fishing. Whatever. What? There's nothing wrong with fishing. But what is it that's taking up your life? Taekwondo? Woo, I mean, yeah. Yeah, see, what's taking up your life? When these things are number one, when they take precedence over your Bible study, we have people online with us right now that are in, in, the, in the hunting grounds. But you know what? They've got a sign on the door that says, uh, do not disturb, we're in Bible class. See, this is, what, this is the idea. I praise them for this. So just give, give that some thought. Now, how about this? Sexual, sexual lust, social lust, approbation lust. Approbation lust is lust for approval. Said, oh, Steve, I just, would you please shake my hand? How about pat me on the back and tell me five nice things about myself? See, that's approbation lust. That's no good. Monetary lust. Whoa, if I just, uh, if I could just do this. Chemical lust. That's uh, drugs, fentanyl, you know that. Crusader lust. Hey, let's go out and shut down these abortion clinics. Abortion is wrong. But we're not called upon by God to go out and carry our guns to the abortion clinic. That's his problem, not yours and not mine. Revenge lust. I'll go ahead. As soon as we're done, you're not going outside. I'm going to take care of this. Okay. Revenge lust. Criminal lust. Okay. Criminal lust. Now, that that's... That's the, the lust patterns that are in the world today. And he says, because you're a born-again Christian, you're living the Christian way of life. You've taken all these things that he's going to give you. And he says, you've escaped all that. You've escaped all of it. Now he says in verse 5, now for this very reason, and that is because as Christians you have escaped the world's corruption. See, you don't do that at babyhood. The potential is at babyhood. The potential is at salvation. And this is why you have to continue on in the Christian way of life. He said, for this very reason, because you've escaped the corruption of the world, also, he says, here's what I want you to do. Now that you are saved, hang on now. He says, now that you're saved, he said, I want you to apply something to your life. He said, I want you to apply diligence. Now, what that means is make every effort. Make every effort. Here's the Bible class. I'm coming to Bible class to learn. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to, I'm going to, try, I'm going to begin to apply. Oh, by the way, don't use the word try. Don't use the word try. Oh, I'm trying to live it. You're failing. And all that is an excuse. It's a rationale to justify the fact that you're not living the Christian way of life. So don't tell me and don't tell somebody, oh, I'm, trying. I'm doing the very best I can. No, you're not. If you did, you'd do it. That's the Christian way of life. So he said, for this very reason, applying all diligence, that means making every effort. And what are you going to make your effort in? 
in your faith. And that's by means of your faith. So what this, what's going to happen here by, by in every effort of my life, I'm going to be, I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to do my, I'm going to do, make every effort in this by means of my faith, by means of faith, that your willingness to trust God. He says, add to that, that word supply means add to. So what are you going to add? You're going to add moral excellence to your life. You're going to add moral excellence. By the way, when you use the word moral, sin and morality are two different things. Sin, sin is a choice that violates God's word. But morality is, is abiding by the five laws of a sti, uh, uh, divine establishment. So an unbeliever can be immoral. A carnal believer can be immoral. Because what they're doing, they're they're allowing their five principles: freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, subtitled free market capitalism, and employment. They're the five laws. If you are abiding by those, you're a moral person, but you go to hell just about the time you die. Okay? And and end up in the lake of fire. Why? Because it's a sin issue. It's a sin issue. Now, what's happening is morality in this country has gone gone berserk. Freedom is being lost. Marriage, I, I listen, I was I saw something the other day. There's some words that are now being used. Marriage is no longer monogamous. But now we have we've got uh we've got couple, we got uh, two men and a woman, two women and a man. They're they're and they're terms that are using, and what they're telling us now, and they're teaching this in certain universities that this is the norm today. This thing about monogamous marriage, no, that's out the window. Be aware of what's going on. This 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 the septic tank you're swimming in. So he said, moral excellence. So add add to your faith moral excellence. That's doing the right thing in the right way. And he says, and add and add to your moral excellence. Add knowledge. Now that word knowledge here is the word gnosis, not epinosis. This is gnosis, and what that means is knowledge gained by firsthand experience. You know what that means? Learning the hard way learning the hard way you learn by experience okay so you add you add moral excellence you add knowledge then and to your knowledge you add self control what is self control that means the ability to control your feelings and overcome your weaknesses self control self control you are doing it yourself okay then to your self control you're supposed to add perseverance and what is perseverance that means when you find yourself in a in a challenging situation what that means is you're going to endure during those challenges of life. And how are you going to endure? You're going to apply God's word to your life and that circumstance. In other words, you're learning to dance in the rain. Okay? And in your perseverance, you're going to add godliness. And this godliness means you're going to function in the sphere of the spirit. Now, if you've not been with me for a while, that phrase in the sphere of the spirit may not mean, may not, may not mean anything to you. But there are three spheres in which we live. Well, there, there are numerous spheres. But in terms of the spiritual life, there's the, there's the sphere of the flesh, the sphere of the spirit, and the sphere of neutrality. Okay? And so you need to understand all, all of those in terms of living out your Christian way of life. If those are not new to you, please ask me. Okay? So we've, we've, what we've done, we've just seen five things here. We've seen, um, uh, by way of diligence, we're going to add to our faith moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and godliness. See, there is the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life is applying those things to your life. This is where you take on the divinity of Christ, where, you, where, you, where you're, you're looking like him. By the way, you're not imitating him. See, Jesus is standing there. He says, uh, let's see what you do, Jesus. He says this. I say, okay, uh, what are you going to do, Jim? He says, oh, yeah, you imitated me. No, but that no, that's not that's not the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life is Jesus in you, and with your understanding of what what he would what he would think, what he would speak, what he would feel, what he would do, you're allowing this to come out of you. So you're not imitating. You're you're producing his life from the inside to the outside. That again is the Christian way of life. Now in verse seven, he said, "In your in your godliness, this is the sixth thing. In your godliness." He said, add brotherly kindness. What is brotherly kindness? That's love for other Christians. That means I have to, this is friendship love. 
Okay, this is friendship level. Uh, that's where uh, I tell Steve what a wonderful man he is. I pat him on the back. I send him Christmas cards, et cetera. That's friendship. You, you understand what that is. But the next one here, to your, to your brotherly kindness, this is where you're being kind to other Christians. Then the next one is agape love. That's that word, love is agape. And what that means, you have a relaxed mental attitude toward all members of humanity. Stop right now. Did you hear that? In your Christian way of life, you learn to have agape love toward all members of the human race. Now, when you take a look at all that's going on, my question is, what kind of an attitude do you have about the people that they're tearing things up in this country? Excuse me. I'll show you a relaxed mental attitude. Is that a relaxed mental attitude? No, no. You see, you can't do anything about this. This is in God's hands. We're looking this direction, not this direction. So agape love is a relaxed mental attitude toward all members of the human race. And by the way, you may work on that, but you'll not have it until you reach spiritual autonomy, knowing how, knowing how to stand on your own two feet. You have this relaxed mental attitude by the time you reach spiritual autonomy. That's the second stage of spiritual maturity. So it's a process, it doesn't come overnight. Now notice what this we said here in, in uh, beyond that. God has already provided. God has already provided for us, provided us with the following things. Faith in verse one, he's provided grace in verse two, provided peace in verse three, and verse uh, peace in verse two. In verse three, he's provided everything pertaining to physical life. In verse three, he's provided everything pertaining to spiritual life. Can't beat that. And in verse four, he's given us precious promises and magnificent promises. Now, seven things that doctrine will uh, will add to your life. In other words, coming to Bible class, learning what the Word of God says. These are six things that doctrine will uh, uh, will give you. See, God gave you the first seven. Now, doctrine is going to give you the second, second, second seven, and all of them been given to us by God in a plan in eternity past. So here here they are. He's given doctrine will give you moral excellence. It'll give you knowledge. It'll give you self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and agape love. Now in verse 8, here's what he tells us in verse 8. This gives us the benefit of adding these last seven things. Why should you add these last things, these last seven things to your life? Well, verse 8 is going to tell us. He said, for if these qualities, now you need to understand something here, and when you look at your notes there, you know what that number one is beside that if, don't you? You know what that stands for? What is that, uh, Dennis? That's a first class condition, okay? Now, first class condition means what? If it is what? If it is true. Second class condition is what? If it is not true. Third class condition is what? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And fourth class conditions, I wish it were true, but it's not. Okay. And so when you look at the when you look at the, the Greek language, or you look at the English, you don't know what you don't know what that is. But when you look at the Greek, there is a there is a certain syntax, there's a certain structure of the language that tells you whether it's a first, second, third, or fourth class condition. Interesting enough here, the word if isn't in, in the in the scripture. They threw this in. It's it's okay for it to be there because it's going to give you the understanding of what is meant in that passage. And so it would, even though it doesn't exist in, in the text, it's implied there and it's implied as a first class condition. So this is what it's saying. For if these qualities are yours and they are, if they are yours and they are, okay, that means they're out here. You, you're, going to, you're going to take them, make them a part of your life. They're, they're a part of who you are now. If these qualities, what is he talking about? He's talking about the seven things we just mentioned. If if moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, agape love, if these are yours, they're working in you. That means they're working in you and are increasing. So what that means is the first time, the first time you apply something, don't care. If I have a if I have a glass here and I've got a thimble here, and I pour the thimble full of water in that glass, I just have a little bit. But if I take that thimble and pour more water in there, pour it in there, and just keep going like this, every time I pour, I increase in capacity inside that glass. 
So what's happening in your Christian way of life as you apply, as you apply, as you apply, what you're doing is you're, you are increasing your capacity for each of these, uh, each of these uh, characteristics. So the more you apply, the better you're doing it, okay? So I said, if these qualities are, are yours and increasing, that's expanding your capacity to use them, they then, these, seven, these same seven things, watch this, they do not make you useless. That's an unusual way of saying that. But he says, look, what is my life? I have, uh, this doesn't seem like I'm, no, if you're doing these things, you're not useless in the, in the, in the plan of God. Now watch, we've seen, we've seen the apostle Paul in Philippians We've seen other apostles, when they go out and they begin to witness, what happens to them? As soon as they begin to witness, what happens to them? They begin to be P, what is it? Persecuted. They begin to be persecuted. So what happens is when, when you are using these, when you're living your Christian way of life, even though you are going to be persecuted, even though you have circumstances that are occurring in your life that are out of your control, God allows that. He allows it to happen. So what are, you, what are you going to do? Are you going to fall apart? No, when you're applying these things, you are not useless in the Christian way of life. Why? Because this guy over here is looking at you. He knows you ought to be falling apart. That's what I would do. I'd fall apart. And he's not falling. What is it about you that this, this is, I'm a born again Christian. I've come to understand that my life is to represent Jesus Christ. I'm to be like him. I have peace no matter what the circumstances of life are. See, that's what he's saying here. If these, if these qualities are increasing in you, and they are, they do not make you useless. What does that mean? You're no longer idle. You're not lazy. You're not thoughtless. You're not unprofitable. You're not injurious. You're not going to hurt anybody. So you're not useless, and you're not unproductive. In other words, you're, make, you're, you're being fruitful in the Christian way of life. You're producing something that's good, divinely good, nor unproductive. Watch this in the true knowledge, the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what happens is we're learning to become exactly like him. Question, do you think Jesus ever failed in a circumstance? Do you think he ever failed? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. No, it's okay. But Jesus never failed in a circumstance of life. He was productive. And when you're taking on the life of Christ, guess what? You will not be unproductive. You will be productive in that situation. Now, what that means is, even though you are productive, that doesn't mean anybody else is going to change their life. Why? It's a choice that they have to make. But you, they have seen who and what Christ is. They've seen uh, the peace, the, the joy that you can have, the rejoicing in the circumstance of life, no matter what they are. Now, note something here. Because let, let me read that verse again. If these qualities, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they do not make you useless nor unproductive in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the note that I want us to see. If you develop these qualities in your life, you will personally know the qualities of the life of Jesus Christ. You will develop these qualities in your life and others will see Jesus in you and be drawn to Jesus. See, that's the, that's the reason why this is taking place. Yes, why, why, why am I not being productive in my Christian way of life? Why am I, why am I uh, not having an opportunity to share the word of God with people? I came out of the bank the other day. Listen, I came out of the bank the other day. I do this all the time anyway. I finally learned that I should do this, be helpful to my wife. When we come out of some place, I walk around the car, I open the door, and she gets in. And I go around the car and get in, get in on my side. And when we, get, when we come out of some place and she's with me, I'll tell her, I'll warn her, don't touch that door handle. I say it'll burn you. you it, it'll electrocute you if, you if you touch that thing. So I don't want to do it because I want to be able to open that door for her to let her in. We came out of the bank the other day. And there was a, a lady that was sitting sitting in the car waiting for some somebody to come out. And I we walked out and I walked, walked around the car and opened the door for Janet. She got in. I walked around the car. That lady rolled down her down her uh, her window and had tears streaming down her eyes. She said, Chivalry isn't dead. <laughs> and I had an opportunity to I had an opportunity in the course of the conversation then to say, Are you a born again Christian? She paused and she said, I think so. 
I said, ma'am, you don't have to think. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. She said, I'm believing. I'm believing. <laughs> listen, you listen. It, 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 listen, you get run over by people looking for answers. But they're not gonna they're not gonna ask you if your life resembles them and even worse. But I know that's not the case here. I'm just encouraging you, okay? Now in verse nine, uh, in verse nine, he gives us the downside of failing to add these seven things. So if you don't add them, what's what's gonna happen? Well, here it is, verse nine. He says, for the one who lacks these qualities, what's he talking about? Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, agape love. If, if, if the one who lacks these qualities, for the one who lacks these qualities is what he says is blind. You got that? Wait a minute. I can see, I can see. No, you're blind spiritually. You're blind, you're saved but you never discover the spiritual nature of the Christian life. This is where religious Christians are failing. They're failing, they're, they're failing. And by the way, here again, it's not their fault. Generally speaking, it's not their fault. Pastors are not teaching this. True or false? True or false? You don't know? Okay. You, you, you don't go to jail for speaking up. Okay, so here it is. So for, for the one who lacks these qualities, he said is blind or short-sighted. Now, what does it, blind, what's that mean? Blind, you've never discovered the spiritual nature of the Christian way of life. Basically, here's the issue. You either haven't been taught or you've been taught and don't believe it, or you've been taught and not applying it, your business. So he said, you're either blind or short-sighted. And short-sighted means you fail to understand, you fail to see that Christ-likeness is mandated, and it's a mandated, reachable goal. It's reachable. David, you hear that? It's reachable. You got that? Tim, you see it? Reachable? Danny, you understand it's reachable? It's a reachable goal. Christ-likeness. Then, um, then he says, uh, you're, you're blind or short-sighted, and he says, having forgotten his or her pur uh, purification, what that means is you've give, you've, you knew that you're saved, but you've forgotten the fact that you've been cleansed from all those sins. You're, it's like putting a, a big whiteboard up there and just, just paint it black. And that's all the sins of your life. And as soon as you say, I believe, God takes a big old cloth up there and just wipes that slate clean. And there you are. Now you're living your Christian way of life and you're just living like, you did before you got saved, you've forgotten that back there. You've forgotten what you are. So the moment you get saved, you start out with a clean uh, a clean slate. You start out in the sphere of the spirit, but it doesn't take but about 30 seconds to get in the sphere of the flesh again because you make some sort of a bad decision. Why? Simply because you don't understand at that point in time. So what it done, you have forgotten your poor purification from your former sins, and that's the sins that you committed before you're saved. Now notice in verse 10, the next thing is you will never stumble. Do you, do you hear that? Kathy, do you hear that? It says you will what? You will never stumble. Dwayne, do you hear that? You will what? Never stumble. Danny, you'll what? Never stumble. What does that mean? It means, listen, well, let's take a look at it. What does that mean? Therefore, he says, brothers and sisters, as born again Christians, be all the more diligent, that means make an all-out effort to make certain, and that word make there in the Greek language is a verb that actually means to keep on making. So therefore, brothers and sisters, be, more, be the more diligent to keep on making certain. What are you wanting to make certain? And making certain means to establish something beyond a reasonable doubt. So you're going to be the more diligent to keep on making certain, establishing beyond a reasonable doubt, about his calling. Now, his calling is, again, God calls you. He sees you believe in Jesus, and he sends the gospel to you, and when the gospel comes to you, that's him calling you. The question, are you going to answer the call? So the call is the presentation of the gospel to anyone who's God-conscious and wanting more information about God so that I can either tell you, go fly a kite, or I want in on that. See, it's a matter of choice. For as long as... And he says, to make certain about 
his calling and choice of you. So what happens, he calls you, he sees you believe, and he, whoop, he chooses you. But guess where he did that? He did that in eternity past because he saw you do it down here in time. He says, for now he goes on and says, for as long as you practice. Now that word practice there means apply, 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 apply. And what are you applying? You're applying these things. What are these things? It's the seven things we just mentioned. As long as you practice moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly love, agape love, what's he say? You will never stumble. And what does that mean? That means that this represents the life of a mature believer. That means you're not sinning. And this represents the life of a mature believer. And God's calling us, mandating us to get to the level of spiritual maturity. We have the, we have the greatest effectiveness out here in life. Question. And ask in all humility. Notice what we said here. It says, you will never stumble. So the question I ask in all humility and objectivity is what part of never stumble do most Christians not understand? What part of that do most Christians not understand? But here's the issue. If I'm sitting up here and telling you, oh, you know, we all sin every day, all sin every day, you're going to think we stumble. That's stumbling. So you have no idea. Well, the, the, the authority up there, that's a pastor. He's up there telling you. He's supposed to know. And he's telling me, so I'll buy that. It just gives you reason to fail, fail, fail. In verse 11, he says, for in this way, for in this way, by adding these seven things, watch this, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom. Now, the, 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 the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, there's an eternal kingdom, which is uh, the kingdom, it's the heavenly kingdom into which all people are, uh, all people who believe are entered. As soon as you as soon as you believe in Jesus Christ, you're entered into the eternal kingdom. You, you've got a space up there waiting for you, okay? Then it goes on to say, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom, the third heaven, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he said, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, let me tell you what that means. So because you're, because you're living this, this way, you're living out your Christian way of life, you're looking to go to heaven, and because you are living this way, it's, it would be like if I walked over there, if I walked over to those doors right now and just pulled them apart a little bit and uh, just had about, about, that, about that wide, and I said, come on in, come on in. Maybe you could squeeze through there, okay? Maybe you could squeeze through there. Well, I say, well, uh, you, can't, you need to come on in, but I see I have to open up a little wider. So let's say, let's say I stand up here and you say, yeah, this is this wide. Come on, let's let's turn around this way. So you open up this. That's what that's how I needed it. Okay. So I slip through the door this way. That's what's going to happen to Christians who are not living the Christian way of life. But when you're doing this right here, guess what? I say, David, get don't do it now. I say, David, get up there and just bang those doors wide open. He goes whoop. And he goes bang, and there you got the whole door there. God's going to, he's going to open the gates of heaven and you're going in, is swinging wide. You know what that means? Boy, when you swing the doors wide open, there's somebody coming that's worth something. You got that? And he says, look, if you'll just do this, he says, I'm going to swing the doors wide open. Oh, if you're not doing it, I, I, you'll get in, but, you know, you had to get through the crack. And by the way, they had, a, that, that, when that hurricane came through here and all that rain, this place flooded over here and the place flooded up there. That rain actually came through the door. That's, sec that's secondary, not important. Okay. Now watch this in verse 12. Beginning in verse 12, the apostle Peter begins to explain the major subject of this chapter, which is the fact that Peter is about to die. But even though he's about to die, he will tell us that there's something that's more important in life than anything else. And that's the word of God, biblical truth, Bible doctrine. That's the most important thing in your life as a born-again Christian. But Peter wants to make this portion of, of chapter 1, this portion of chapter 1, his dying declaration. So Peter's getting ready to die. He's already dead, but he's, he's just about to die. And he wants to leave a message with you and me. So his dying declaration to born-again believers, that's us, of every future generation, that's us, and that includes you and me, he wants to make that declaration. And here's what he's going to do. One of the most dramatic 
one of the most important passages in the entire Bible from the standpoint of experiential Christianity. That means not only are you are you're not just a Christian, you're actually living it. You're experiencing the fullness of the Christian life. That's green circle living for those of you who understand what I mean. And that begins in verse 12 where we are now, where the apostle Peter in his dying moments begins to remind us of what really is important in our life on earth in the importance and the reality and importance of the word of God in verse 12. He says in this in, in that verse, therefore, that means because of this, because of your orientation to God's grace provision, remember verse one, verse two, God's provision, his grace. Therefore, I, Peter says, I will always be ready. Now watch this folks, so that some of you, some of you might say to me, Dr. Jim, listen, we've been with you for, 30 years, they've been with you for 25 years, 16 years, three months, and just sounds like you're saying the same old thing over and over and over and over again. Listen, why don't you get off that and tell us something new? Hold it now. Peter's just about to wrap you. Oh, hold on just a second. He said, therefore, always be ready. I will always be ready to remind you. Oh, if you're reminding, guess what? If I'm reminding you, I've already told you something. So I'm going to tell you again. That's remind, okay? Said, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, the things listed in verses two through seven. He said, I'm ready, I'm, I'm always be ready to remind you, even though you what? Even though you already know them. Just a second, okay. Even though you already know them, he's gonna remind you, keep on reminding and reminding you. So even though you already know them and have been established, that means you're, you're stable, stable and mentally, you already understand all this. You are, you are established in the truth, which is present with you always. In other words, you already have this information. So next week I say, okay, I tell you what, folks, come on back next week. I've got a message for you. you say, what is that? I said, I'm gonna teach you first Peter, second Peter chapter one, verses one through 15. He said, wait a minute, I already told you already told us that. See, that's what Peter's saying here. I'm gonna tell you again and again and again and again. Now watch moving on now. And since we're getting close to being out of time, I'm going to move down here. Now, notice this. Here are these things. He said, teaching you these things granted to us by divine power through the knowledge and through the true knowledge of God. Everything pertaining to God. He said, I'm going to tell you again. Great. God's precious and magnificent promise. I'm going to keep telling you. Moral excellence. I'm going to keep telling you. Knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness. Brotherly kindness, I'm going to keep on telling you, telling you, telling you, reminding you. See, you need this to live the Christian way of life. So these things in verse, verses, uh, the, the points one through nine, these things represent the true nature of Christianity as a spiritual way of life. They're foreign. They are foreign to Christianity when Christianity is practiced as a religion. Now, in, uh, by, well, by the way, that's it. That's the end of the class. That's the end of the notes. So we've actually... We finished on time. I thought we we're going to have some more there. So here's the issue. The question is, are you going to live the Christian way of life or are you not? It's up to you. It's your choice. But knowing the circumstances of life, God has a way of peace. He's got a way of uh, handling the sufferings. And by the way, you're going to suffer for two reasons. Either going to suffer for as a test for growth because you're doing something right. Or you're, going to suffer, you're going to suffer because you're doing something wrong. Which of the two would you rather? Suffer for doing something right or suffer for doing something wrong? Obviously, it would be suffering for some, doing something right. And that is the Christian way of life, okay? So let us pray. Okay. Father, thank you for your provision for us um, this morning uh, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 15. I thank you for every person that's here this morning and online with us on Facebook and, and uh, WebEx. And I pray, Father, that the message has been clear. I pray that people understand uh, through the Spirit's guidance that guidance through his teaching us that this is the Christian way of life. This is not some game we're playing. This is not some pastor looking for money or prestige or anything else. It's trying to help people understand what life is all about in the midst of the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Therefore, if we have questions, Father, I pray that we would ask for clarification. We can't go on, I hope so, maybe. Can't, that doesn't work in the Christian way of life. We must know and have solid information that comes from your word. I praise you for all the folks that are here. I thank you, Father, uh, for um, for uh, for Andy and his wife coming from California, business, and coming to Bible class with us. I thank you for those who've come in 60 miles, 30 miles, 
20 miles or right around the corner to be here today. I thank you for all of them, Father. Bless us in your, in your son's name. Amen. Now, let's do one thing. We're about to open the doors and have, uh, have dinner served. So let me, uh, uh, let's see. Dwayne, pray for us. Pray for us. Amen. Okay, Let, uh, let's open the door and tell them we're, we're ready whenever they are. If you're staying for lunch and you haven't ordered your lunch, you need to do it. There are restrooms on left and right. Dude, Jesus. <laughs> 